Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission for Monday, September the 20th, 2010. Could we have the roll call, please? Commissioners Bennett? Here. Patrick? Here. Rob Fogel? Here. Sharkey? Uh, is absent. And President Kahn? Here. The agenda for the September 20th, 2010 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on Tuesday, September 14, 2010. Item 2, Commission staff comments. Do we have any comments? Uh, just what a fabulous event, and I'm sure you're very proud, but what a fabulous event the Casino Americana was. And uh, we, the special guest that nobody knew about was Howie Mandel. Came down. I guess he was filming something that day there, and it was a it was really a great event. And the park open the groundbreaking for Griffith Manor Park also very well attended and a wonderful event. Great. I, I second. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay, there you go. <laughs> look, look, I do have just one comment. In sure, if you uh, happen to see today's news press, uh, there was an article about Laura Friedman talking about making us more electronic and less paper um, intensive. And I, I happen to be a person who, who very much takes to that philosophy. And so what I tr did was I happened to be owner of a Kindle, and I thought, I wonder if I could download all our information that we have today on my Kindle. I, I didn't take all the time, but I have our agenda on here. It's real easy to read. and. She mentioned an iPad. Uh, the iPad's pretty expensive. A Kindle is a heck of a lot less expensive. And at least for some of us, we could do it all electronically. Great. And the iPad does work. Uh, you can actually download the reports also on the iPad. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you could. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Did you have anything? No. Okay. Rodney? Before, before you. Uh, I wanted to mention and I wanted to, to thank the fellow commissioners for attending the Casino Mar Americana. It was very successful for us for PATH Achieve Glendale. We actually had about 400 people that attended, and we raised about $200,000. So it was a very successful event for us. Uh, it was about, we did the same thing last year, and we raised a little bit more money this time, and we had a lot more people. So we're very proud of it. A few hiccups here and there, but uh, overall it was very, very enjoyable. So thanks for you guys coming. I thought it was great. Uh, thanks for the city of Glendale, because they were really supportive uh, for the event and for PATH Achieve Glendale. That was one thing. Uh, the second thing Steve mentioned also, we had our groundbreaking for Griffith Manor Park. And I think, and, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, since we were off last month, we also had our grand opening for the Adult Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was something that took place after our last event. Right. So that was that's real neat, too. Oh, yes. So it sounds like we're doing a lot of fun and exciting things. Um, first of all, I, I do want to thank you uh, for mentioning the, the work the staff does did for the Path Achieve. We really do appreciate that. You know, sure. I know these, these guys over here, these folks are kind of unsung heroes, and they are working behind the scenes. So thank you very much for, for mentioning sure. their names. Um, second, as you know, we had uh, a fire vandalism at one of our playgrounds, which is Glorietta. Uh, just so that the people um, viewing can, can know what's going on is we're going to replace that as soon as possible. We're getting a price on it now. Uh, we are somewhat limited in terms of what we can put there because we can't put footings. It's over a reservoir. Um, so we will replace the equipment probably with what we had there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the, the price and, and moving forward with getting a contractor to put that out there. Uh, and then we'll look at, of course, the city attorney is looking at reimbursement from the parents of these two kids. So uh, we don't want people to be without the equipment, so we'll try to find some money uh, and then reimburse uh, us for the work that gets done. So just to let people know, we're going to get that equipment out there Great. sooner than later, and I know people enjoy that equipment out there. Okay. And that was it. Great. Thanks. One other thing is I forgot to mention about the Adult Recreation Center. Uh, Friday, October 1st at 7 a.m., uh, the Glendale Sunrise Rotary Club is going to meet there. And uh, if it all works out, there might be, it might become a per permanent change. And uh, we're really excited about 
the prospect of meeting at that facility and bringing more people into the facility. Cool. Anything else? Great. What's next? Item three, oral communications. I don't believe we have any cards. Item 4A, under consent items, approval of the minutes of the commission regular meeting held on July 19, 2010. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, I'll take roll call. Commissioners Bennett? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Rob Fogel? Yes. Sharkey is absent. President Kahn? Yes. Item 5A, under business agenda, reports for information only. 5A1, annual report of youth and family services. And I'd like to call up Walter Alvarez. And Walter is our community services supervisor who oversees this program. And this program is at-risk youth, family issues, and also our um, adult developmentally disabled population. So Walter, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Khan, members of commission, and department staff. My name is Walter Alvarez. I'm the supervisor for the Youth and Family Services Program, as uh, Mr. Chapjian stated. And um, the Youth and Family Services Program has been in existence for nine years at this point, uh, and it's been providing a valuable resource to the community. Um, one of the main goals is to identify at-risk youth and families um, in the community, uh, do individual assessment needs, and from then on we move forward to link them to necessary services uh, that the family may need in order to resolve their issues uh, or any general problems they may have. Uh, at the same time, we also provide case management for some of these youth because a lot of the youth are involved with uh, uh, probation, they're with probation department mandated to comply with certain orders. So a lot of times we collaborate with a lot of the agencies in the community to um, navigate these youth uh, to remain in compliance with, with the court orders. Uh, again, uh, we target youth be starting from the age of 13 and we go all the way to 18 uh, and then we move on forward to the transition base from 18 to 24 if they're young adults with children, minor children involved and they may need that additional push uh, into adulthood. Um, again, we do provide various services. We also provide informational workshops. Um, this year we touch on a number of topics. Some of those topics included transcending bullying, uh, the Wise Consumer Workshop, Teen Driving Safety, Youth Financials First, uh, understanding the juvenile justice system because a lot of the parents get lost in this whole process and as well as uh, Teens for Teens workshop just kind of giving them an understanding of what it means to go through that uh, rites of passage of being teens. Um, we established numerous collaboratives this year, actually three of them that have been very healthy for us, for our program and the community, and that is with Glendale Unified Healthy Start. Um, we, through that collaboration, we now bring uh, free parenting classes uh, for Spanish-speaking parents. Uh, we were able to enroll 12, and actually we're going to graduate our first class uh, this coming week. And then from there, we also partner with Asian Youth Center. That's a a center based in uh, San Gabriel Valley, and we're going to provide English parenting classes to their program as well, again, free of cost to the community. Uh, the other one is a collaboration with them as well. We established Operation Read as a state literacy program. The goal of that is to improve the reading skills of the youth uh, at least by one or two grade levels. And again, we currently have seven kids enrolled in that program, and then this, that's an ongoing program until so they reach that level of uh, uh, once they reach a reading level, then they kind of graduate out of the program. Uh, we targeted, uh, in regards to information, in information and referrals uh, this year, we successfully referred, well, we got 168 unduplicated clients, and we generated 364 referrals. Out of the 364, 291, which is 80%, were utilized to meet the client's needs. So again, the way we do that is direct linkages. So we don't just give a number. We make contact with the agencies that provide the service, and we provide them a name and meeting time and appointments for the parents and the youth to meet with these individuals in, in the community and nonprofit agencies. Uh, 36 kids, 36 youth received case management services throughout the year. Of those 36, 19, 54% youth completed their case management uh, plan, uh, meaning they complied with all the orders listed within their plan and successfully transitioned out of um, not being, no longer being on probation or, you know, 
just complying with all the services and working with probation officers to achieve that goal. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's what we did this year. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. You guys have questions? Sounds like a busy year. It was. <laughs> I did have a question. I, you, sure. you mentioned that um, it's more of a comment. One is, is that it looks like you've been more successful in uh, the youth completing their case plan and terminating their probation this year than you were last year. Yes. Much more. Um, do you know why? What is that a cause from? Is it just... It, well, I like to say part of it is us, but again, it's recidivism, just, you know, whether kids get involved again. So what happened last year is that a lot of these kids have become repeat offenders, so they end up being detained in camps, and they, you know, they're not able to continue with compliance. So I think this year, the fact that they didn't, you know, get detained or violated the conditions, it attributes to the success of our program as well. Right. And do you like your new facility over at... <laughs> it is wonderful, yes, by the way. If, no, I think most of you had a, had a chance to go there, but it, it's great. Yes, love it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alter. Item 5A2, Sports Complex and League Revenue Report. Good afternoon, President Khan, members of the Commission, Department staff. Uh, my name is Courtney Maglio. I'm Community Services Coordinator with uh, the Community Services Department. I'm here for Gabrielle Golia, the Community Services Supervisor. And I'm here to present the Sports Complex and Sports, sports League's Annual Revenue Report. Uh, the Glendale Sports Complex is comprised of three fenced fields uh, for both softball and one of them can be converted into a baseball field, as well as two artificial turf soccer fields. In addition, there's a meeting room and an outside patio area at the complex that's available for rent. Uh, the sports section staff reserves all of these fields and facilities as well as um, 12 outlying facilities. Uh, we operate an adult slow pitch uh, softball league, adult soccer leagues, adult basketball, as well as various softball tournaments. And um, we have also identified some adult soccer play time for uh, adults 40 and over, as well as adults 70 over on weekday mornings. And um, the complex as of now must be self-sustaining and operate with an annual profit. And all of the maintenance of the facility, including staffing and ut utilities and supplies, is paid for with the revenue generated from the rentals, leagues, concessions, tournaments, and grants. Um, the adult softball uh, program is offered uh, Monday through Sunday. We offer men's slow pitch Tuesday through uh, Saturday. We offer women's on Monday nights, and we offer co-ed on both Sundays and Mondays. And um, we did have a very slight decline in the number of registered teams for this past year, and that was uh, due to a closure in one of our fields where we had to renovate. Um, so we went down to 475 teams as opposed to um, last year's total of 506 teams, but small decline for, um, for the closure of one field. Um, the adult slow pitch program generated um, a net revenue of $110,955, and that was after all the expenses were paid. Um, we, ha we offer a basketball program, which uh, this year we had 103 teams registered. Um, unfortunately, that was also a slight decline, but that was due to the fact that the um, gyms available for the city's use were not the same as they were in 2009. Um, typically, we use uh, Hoover and Clark High School gymnasiums as well as Pacific Community Center, um, but we were unable to use Pacific um, during the Winter League, um, which limited the available spots for for teams during that season. Um, the adult basketball league's uh, revenue, the net revenue was 14,500. Um, we also offer a soccer league um, where uh, teams play on both Thursday nights and Saturday mornings. Last year, uh, we have a total of 40 spots. Last year, we filled 37 of those spots with three spots remaining for Saturday mornings. This year, we filled all 40 
uh, spaces. Staff is looking into methods right now for increasing the number of spots available because it's a very popular program. And um, we want to do so without taking time away from private rentals or youth groups. And so one of the options is potentially shortening the game time. Uh, another is to uh, make the season 10 weeks and eliminating um, the final the final championship game. Um, and that would allow, those potential suggestions may allow for three seasons, um, but we are sending surveys out to all of the uh, existing participants to get some feedback from them in terms of what, um, what they feel might be um, viable. Uh, as a result, the Soccer League net revenue was $16,000. Um, the total expenditures for this fiscal year was 700, approximately 710,000, whereas the revenue was 844, approximately 844,000, which left the total revenue for this fiscal year at 133,331. Um, this did include a reduction in the grant. So last year, um, the the grant amount was 260,000, whereas this year it was 175,000. Um, in addition, we profited um, slightly more because last year the sports complex operated the snack bar, and this year the sports complex did not, and we operated the snack bar at a deficit of approximately $11,755, um, and so that's another contributing reason as to why the revenue increased a bit for this fiscal year. I think that concludes my report, unless anybody has any questions. You guys have questions? Just on the concessions, are we renting out that facility to somebody to to sell concessions or? As of right now, the youth group um, Babe Ruth is operating the snack bar as a service to the teams, but because it's not a revenue generating operation, I'll. I'll defer. Right. It's it's not really not generating revenue. It's kind of turning itself over. We have a combination of our vending machines as well as our uh, the snack bar itself. So it's it, it's up and down based on the season when the teams are playing uh, and it's full go. Everything's full go. Then the snack bar is doing okay. But when there's those lulls in between, it's not. Our games are less than an hour, so it makes it difficult to attract people to to that snack bar. That's why we've had that difficulty. So uh, Babe Ruth has has taken it on as kind of a challenge to see if they can make it work. And we're kind of at, toward the end. We're somewhat at the end of that experiment right now to see how it's going to go. We, we've had concessionaires there before. They just couldn't make it a go. Right. Uh, unless you lock the facility, don't let people bring in sodas or drinks and have them buy it at the concession, it's just not business financially sure. uh, viable for them to do that. It seems to me if if the people who use it aren't complaining, I mean, we're doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can lose money. And if they're happy... It's not like a bad deal. And our vending machines are doing pretty well, so we're pretty happy with that. We could probably increase those vending machines and take a look and see what we actually offer to the public. We've gone more uh, uh, quality control with the type of drinks that are there, and on the soccer fields themselves, it's all water. So over at the other end of the complex where we don't have synthetic turf, we've got snacks and we've got the uh, uh, some some sodas, but mostly Powerades. That they love the, the energy drink, so we're, we're in that direction over there. You, you had mentioned, too, that we're not using as much of the grant. Are we trying not to use the grant? I think we're systematically reducing the amount of the grant each it, year. It's actually Prop A money, which is per capita, and we get that every year because the sports complex is a regional complex, and, and Prop A money was used to two um, different Prop A's. 199, I think 196, and they they expire in 2015 and 2017. So we have to wean ourselves off of that. Okay. It, it subsidizes the operation up to the maintenance. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 5A3, open studio tour report. And I'd like to call up Ripsime Marashan, who is our arts and culture uh, staff person. Good afternoon. President Khan, Commissioners, my name is Rupes Memorashian and I am the Cultural Affairs Coordinator. I'm here to give you a report about our Open Studio Tour, the sixth annual Open Studio Tour, and um, the art exhibition. 
Um, my report is also um, going to be very brief, but I do have a PowerPoint presentation for to make my report visually more appealing for you. Sure. Very briefly about our um, Open Studio Tour. Um, this is our sixth annual Open Studio Tour. Oh, hold on one quick second, please. <laughs> we haven't started yet. Um, the Open Studio Tour has been in, um, started back in 2004, and since then it's been uh, growing bigger and better every year. Um, to give you a general idea about this project, it's a self-guided tour, citywide event, a big event, uh, where a public visits artists and um, to experience their work, to see a variety of art styles, and have an idea about their techniques and their inspiration. Um, artists um, get um, benefited from this project by um, showing their work, networking with public, and um, everything is for free for artists. There is no cost for them and for the public as well. For, uh, for the first time this year, we had um, more than 200 um, art submissions from uh, 27 cities. And out of um, 208, 182 artists participated on the day of the tour. And um, as an added bonus, every uh, participating artist can show one of their artworks at the Brand Library Art Galleries as being part of this project. So 145 artists exhibited their work um, at the Brand Library Art Galleries from July 17 to August 13. This year, because we had so many artists, guest artists, um, that wanted to join uh, Glendalians at this tour, we end up uh, providing them community centers and parks um, as an exhibition locations. Part of those locations were um, Adams Square uh, Mini Park, Chess Park, Brand Art Studio, YMCA, Vertigo Park, to make um, the event, uh, to promote this event and create excitement, we have promoted um, the Open Studio Tour in uh, many magazines and advertised um, at the Glendale News Press, uh, LA Weekly, Daily News, Pasadena Weekly. We send out press releases and um, our newsletter that goes out every month. Uh, we also um, created thousands of postcards, flyers, um, colorful maps, and distributed everything um, throughout the city. Mm. We made big posters for the businesses um, who were supporting the artists at, at this event, showing and sponsoring by um, providing their space as an exhibition location, we gave them uh, big posters. Every artist um, who was part of the show, we uh, created portfolios of their artwork um, and um, showcased them on our website, which is glendalartsandculture.org. And the purpose of that is not only to promote um, the Open Studio Tour, also to um, give them an opportunity to connect right up after the event is over to be in connect with art loving community. The Open Studio Tour was um, also promoted on, on GTV6 for several weeks and with this. Oh, it took us to the website. It's a very artsy, fun website where you can go and um, 
Well, every um, participating artist's portfolio and see their styles. Uh, we actually have their um, information where public can directly connect with them and um, go and see their work at their working environment as well. As I mentioned earlier, um, art exhibition is part of this project and it's a huge project by itself. Um, opening reception that we held at the Brand Library Art Gallery was very well attended. More than 500 people showed up on the day of the uh, opening reception. Among them was um, council member Quintero, commissioners, um, media personnel, and many guests out of town. This event was uh, very nicely documented by the GTV6 and broadcasted uh, for several weeks after the event was over. Just samples of artworks. If you would like me to keep it longer, just let me know. <laughs> That's okay, you can move forward. We have a lot to do. <laughs> As of today, we received um, 46 surveys from the artists, and most of them indicated that the Open Studio Tour is a valuable tradition in our city, but we do need some improvement uh, in some areas. Um, 35 out of 46 said they would like to be part of it again, to, uh, they will participate again. Only three indicated they will not. From our own observations on the day of the tour, there were some locations that were experiencing slow attendance, but um, there were um, many other locations uh, where artists were uh, grouping and they were selling their artwork and they indicated in their surveys that this was a financial success for them. On the day of the tour, unfortunately, we had a small glitch with the beeline buses uh, due to the uh, scheduling error, which um, made it some artists were kind of disappointed, and visitors also. Even though Open Studio Tour is a self-guided tour, and we provided all the tools, um, free maps and directions um, for, for public to go and visit the artists. But that's another um, thing that we provide at the Open Studio Tour for those who would like to take the tour <coughs> instead of driving on their own. Staff um, recommends next year to start the planning of the Open Studio Tour at least six, six months prior to um, the tour. This one was produced within 11 weeks um, with our limited staff. Um, that was, uh, we had a lot of challenges, but we did help, have help from Glendale Youth Association who provided us with youth helpers. Um, to um, mail out uh, collaterals, do the Excel files, and do other things, clerical help. We would like, next, for next year, we would like to involve the community, the art community. We will um, form a committee that um, consists of artists and businessmen to help us out with the planning and executing the next year's project. We would like to see artists are committed to this project and businesses are ready to sponsor a location and be part of this wonderful tradition. This concludes my report. If you have any questions, yes, I'll be more than happy to answer. Questions. Well, I like your recommendations. At the end, I, I just forgot to say that uh, we've been very thankful to um, everybody who helped us uh, uh, some of them are the businesses who have been very supportive. It's Brand Mini Mart, Cafe Victoria, Octopus Restaurant, Porto's Bakery, who always has been very, very um, supportive of it. YMCA, Brand Library Art Gallery for their um, 
beautiful installation of the art exhibition. I think Commissioner Patrick has a question. Please. Sure. Yes, I just, uh, unfortunately I was not able to attend, but I just wanted to say as a, a member of the Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation that the art from the ashes exhibit was able to be part of this, uh, uh, of this particular project. And there were uh, visitors all day long to the art from the ashes. So from our standpoint, being able to be involved in this was really a great experience. And it thank was, you yes. so much. And you're very welcome. And it was really nice. It was the closing day of the art from the ashes. And it was. we did our best to promote the event as well. I think we sold about $3,000 worth of art on that last day. Oh, fantastic. So it was a, it was a great experience. Thank, thank you for you. sharing that with me. The other thing I'd add is you may want to consider is that if you had 38 different locations That's to correct. consolidate those, because I, I went to a few and I saw like the park and I saw art from the ashes, and then it just seemed that it was so scattered if you actually wanted to do it. It certainly would make a lot of sense to maybe have, you know, a dozen or ten or something like that. That way you guarantee that there's going to be a lot of foot traffic for all the artists. You're absolutely right, uh, President Khan. We are thinking about centralizing um, the locations or maybe having just one big location, sure. one big park. This way it will be much easier for the public to come and visit and artists, it will direct all energies and um, energies into the one, one location okay. and will save public driving around and wasting some time on driving. Exactly. That's why it's important for us to visit, um, to revisit the concept altogether for next year's Open Studio Tour. Well, thank you for doing this, though. Thank, thank you. you very much. Item 5A4, Adult Recreation Center opening. Uh, Dave Ahern was going to make this presentation. He went home sick, so standing in for Dave is going to be George Valteria. Well, the, uh, the event went off uh, very well. <laughs> it was well attended. I think uh, a lot of folks really enjoyed the food. But uh, it was really a, a nice event. And uh, like I said, it went for a large facility with that large amount of people attending. It uh, went really well and very smooth. So uh, we're very proud of uh, the new facility. And... Uh, the project management team uh, that worked on that uh, did an excellent job, uh, and uh, with minor, you know, with minor uh, glitches, you know. So we're very pleased with it. We're, I think it'll serve the community for a long, long time, and uh, it's been a long time in coming. But uh, we're really, really proud of it. How is it? How's it going now? How's it operating now? And then I know there's a second phase to it because we drive by there? The operation's under Joanne, so Joanne can answer oh, I can that. answer that. It's going great. Uh, you had a, a number of um, classes in the old build, the old, old, old buildings where they were kind of bulging out, and now it's a lot more spacious the first couple, week, couple weeks, and now it's bulging again. So a lot of people are using the facility. We're really excited. The exercise room is a hit. Everyone is excited about it. We're We've got too many people in there. We're getting it under control with someone who's going to be working with them as far as circuit type training and helping them use the machines properly. So that'll be helpful also. Uh, we've got classes and activities going. Uh, Glendale College has come back with a number of their, their classes that they offer community service for free. Uh, we're just excited to have everybody there. We just, we're just overrun. It's just a lot of people using it, a lot of new pe faces coming in, so that's exciting. The dining hall is busy every single day. Uh, the exercise class, which was once condensed into a little activity room, has now outgrown the dining hall. All the tables and chairs get moved out every single day. So it's very staff intensive as far as setting up, taking down, cleaning up, but everyone's really excited to have everyone there and using it. I, I, just so that you know, I've looked at the demographics in that area. There's about 10,000 seniors living walking distance to the ARC. Wow. And the projected demographics are that it would go up to about 18,000 in the next 10 years. Wow. Um, so we're going to see some heavy use of that facility by the seniors. It's a beautiful facility, though. It really came out nice. So what's the, what's the timing for the second part, you know, where they're doing we've, the great... We've already thing? started, yeah. No. Uh, you, you don't mean building another facility. No, no, no. no, no. Um, 
we, we're looking at, we're probably just going to put grass there at this point um, uh, because the redevelopment agency is looking at a few options in that area. Uh, potentially at some point it could be used for subterranean parking for a larger redevelopment project. Um, so we're going to keep it as simple as possible right now uh, on that site. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Item 5A5, tea ceremonies at Brand Park Tea House. Uh, Moni Carrera from our recreation section is going to give this report. Good afternoon, President Khan, commissioners, and fellow department staff. Um, I believe at one of our recent commission meetings, uh, Commissioner Rotvogel asked for some additional information regarding the tea ceremonies at Brand Friendship Garden Tea House. So I worked with our lead docent, Keiko Nakata, from the Friends of Shoseon, uh, and I, I, in your packets, I believe you have a more detailed report, but I just like. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, you know, for your interest. Um, the main foundation of a tea ceremony is hospitality. Um, it's referred to as chato, or the way of tea, and it's based on four basic principles, which are respect, purity, tranquility, and harmony. Uh, the original Grand Tea Master, Han Sai, coined the phrase peacefulness through a bowl of tea when the U.S. and Japan signed a peace treaty uh, about 60 years ago in San Francisco. Uh, the current tea instructors at Whispering Tea House, uh, the Whispering Pine Tea House, are Julie Bagish and Keiko Nakata. Um, both instructors have studied diligently for many, many years. Uh, Keiko, as a matter of fact, is an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University. Uh, an actual tea ceremony is pretty extensive. It takes about two hours to prepare. The ceremony lasts about 40 minutes. Uh, prior to guests walking into the tea house, there's a stone basin outside of the tea house where you cleanse your heart, your mind of what they call worldly dust. Um, upon entering, you have to wear white socks. It's very, very, very um, uh, professional. It's very quiet. Uh, there's no talking, not even with the tea instructors. Um, guests are given a brief guideline of tea etiquette and a, a, a small historical background of tea culture. All of the implements used down to the tatami mats, the kimonos, the, the cups, the pots, everything, they all are required to be handcrafted by Japanese artisans who actually know about tea culture. Uh, during the ceremony, obviously, tea and imported sweets from Japan are given. Um, as I mentioned, the actual ceremony lasts approximately 40 minutes. They can cater to about 10 people on the alcove area where the tatami mats are and an additional 20 people seated in chairs. Uh, the fees for each person are $20 and the minimum uh, amount for a tea ceremony is $200, so approximately 10 people. Uh, to request a, a tea ceremony, you can always call me at uh, Parks and Recreation at 818-548-3813. Um, I also obtained uh, permission from Keiko Nakata, the lead docent. Uh, you can actually call her directly, and she asked if I could give her number out because they were sure. trying to further the tea ceremonies. Uh, her phone number is 626-798. 7373. Um, currently, our agreement with the docent organization is that they have the third Sunday of every month to prepare a tea ceremony if they have a request. But as long as we don't have any other wedding reservations in the garden, we're more than happy to give up a date for any group that requests. So this pretty much concludes my report, even unless you had any other questions. What's, what's the usage? How, how, is there something happening every third Sunday? And if so, is there more than one? Uh, no, actually, that's just the day that the friends of our docent group chose. Um, we find Sundays are less, we have less weddings on Sundays. But if they ever wanted to have, like, let's say there's a group that just wanted a specific day, as long as we don't have a reservation, we're more than happy to give it to them so they can prepare a ceremony. Well, let me let me rephrase that. Roughly, how many tea ceremonies do we have there in a month? Uh, it depends on request. If we should only have one, but we don't have one every month because we don't have that many requests right now. They're actually performed by the docents, not actually my department. So we technically could have one minimum, but it just depends on uh, you know people's requests. Only do you know how many they had last year? I believe they had seven or eight last year. Okay. Yes, 
Yeah, and I think what's important is we also rent that out. So a lot of the times, most the use mostly is rental of that facility. It's really a nice that's, garden. It's a really nice facility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, recently the, the park staff just redid all the filters in the pond. It's, yeah, it's oh, literally it's clear. Yeah. You can see it's beautiful. It's something yeah. worth seeing. When is the tea house open for people just to go up and walk and... Uh, well, the tea house itself is closed per agreement with the docents. Uh, we're not allowed to let the public inside, uh, but you can come visit the tea house Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, if anybody wanted a tour, we can always open it. We're we're open pretty late in the studio, so. But I think the question is: the grounds are open. 10 you to 3. Actually, walk all around it. I mean, you, you can, can actually see walk. everything you need to see. Yeah, 10 right. to 3. Except Monday the inside Thursday. of the house. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what's the main use? Is it for wedding receptions? Uh, actually, our main use are uh, commercial photography, uh, photography for wedding photos, uh, 15th birthday photos, and weddings. There's no alcohol allowed or DJ music, so we normally just do ceremonies, not receptions. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Item 5A6, GYA closeout report. And I'll call up Karine Gregorian, who's in charge of our GYA program. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karina Gregorian. I'm the program supervisor for the Glendale Youth Alliance. Um, and I am presenting the 2009-10 program year. Oh. Okay, the Glendale Youth Alliance is a nonprofit organization with, which operates within the city of Glendale. It was established in 1993, and since then we've served over 5,500 youth. The purpose of the Glendale Youth Alliance as a youth service organization is to provide, coordinate, and support youth employment activities, efforts, and programs that have a positive impact on Glendale area youth. GYA operates six programs for youth ages 14 to 24. Annually, we serve over 480 youth. Uh, we have two revenue generating enterprise programs, one of which is our Glendale Youth Employment Partnership Program. In this program, private property owners or city departments can hire the youth to do general labor tasks, hillside brush clearance, weed abatement, and so forth for a fee. Uh, the Glendale Resources for Employment and Training uh, youth are placed in different departments of the city or for profit organizations, and we bill for the wages of the youth. Uh, we also have four grant-operated programs that we operate. The first one is our team program, training, employment, and mentorship program. And this is focused at serving high school seniors, typically 17, 18 years of age, um, giving them uh, hands-on work experience and training to uh, move up in the future and go to continue their post-secondary education. Our EIP, Employment Incentive Program, is focused at serving uh, youth ages 18 to 21. These are our older youth. And the purpose of this program is to um, be able to provide permanent employment for the youth. And we're pretty successful, I would say. 85% of the youth in the program um, are able to obtain employment after completing um, our training portion. The Hospitality Training Program is focused at placing youth between the ages of 17 to 24 in the hospitality industry, also training them to be prepared and uh, able to move up in the career ladder. And the Summer Youth Employment Training Program is the largest program that we operate. Um, it actually has two components. One is our brush clearance. 65 of our youngest youth uh, perform clear, uh, brush clearance on the public hill sites to prevent fires. And the second component is placing youth in various nonprofits and for profits in the community to gain work experience. Uh, the funding for the Glendale Youth Alliance. Sorry, I'm having difficulty with the clicker, <laughs> the mouse. Um, GYA has a budget of approximately $2.3 million. The city of Glendale and various departments contribute about $253,000, which is 11% of our budget. Uh, the grants contribute or are approximately 49% of our budget at $1.1 million. 
and the revenues generated from the two enterprise programs are 923,000. Yes. Do, does CDBG funds fall into any of those categories? Is that the grants or? Yes, the grants. Uh, CDBG is about $80,000. How much? GYA staff, we have a total of 13 staff members, one program supervisor, two coordinators, three program specialists that are classified, three program specialists that are unclassified, <laughs> one accounting technician, and three hourly city workers. Our board of directors um, oversees the management of the business affairs and guides the direction of the organization. They set forth the str strategic plan for the future and is active in the fundraising efforts of our organization. Our board members bring unique perspective and experience to the organization and ensure the financial solvency of the organization. And we currently have about 19 uh, board members. Some of the fundraising and special events we do on an annual basis is um, our annual luncheon, um, which usually has about 500 guests, youth, parents, community partners. Uh, this year we did our first ever golf tournament in partnership with the Greg Bus Yeager Memorial Foundation, which was a huge success. Uh, we've done a roast fundraiser in the past. We're um, pretty active in the community doing United Way contributions and campaigns throughout the year. And we also have other fundraising efforts um, at a smaller scale. Uh, some of the accomplishments in the 2009-10 uh, fiscal year. As I mentioned, GYA operated six programs and ser served over 480 youth. Um, we operated the largest summer program in the history of the organization. 65 of the youngest youth worked in our brush program, while 250 of the older youth worked in the spectrum of industries. I believe the total count for the work sites were 109 work sites, and the grants pay uh, for the 100, up to 180 hours of work experience covered the workers' compensation, we provide training for all of the youth in the program, and case management. Um, all youth completed pre-employment training, and 95% of the youth completed 100 to 180 hours of paid work experience. Some of our new uh, partnerships. GYA was in endorsed by United Way and PIRA, Professionals in Human Resource Association. Um, we have collaboration efforts with various community organizations, including uh, the Glendale Fire Department, Police Department, the School District, uh, Glendale Community College, Los Angeles Community College, YMCA, and many others. Uh, we also work with the Commission on the Status of Women, our Family Center, and other organizations. GYA is also a member of the Glendale Chamber of Commerce, Armenian Chamber, Glendale Healthy Kids Coalition, Verdugo School to Cure, CAB, and so forth. Um, over 100 youth were hired in permanent employment within the past year. Um, some of the other accomplishments of our organization is that youth are encouraged to continue higher education. Um, since 19, uh, I'm sorry, since 2002, GYA has been able to grant 68 scholarships to graduating seniors. Um, youth are off the streets, reducing the crime rates, gaining meaningful employment and life skills. Uh, youth are provided with training, case management, and supportive services as needed. All youth are earning money, contributing, and are becoming contributing members of our society and gaining the, the skills needed to succeed in our workforce. Um, one of the greatest challenges in our program is uh, that we have a lot more youth interested in the programs than, than we can serve. This past summer, we had over 1,500 applicants for our summer program, and we were able to serve 350. I mean, 350 is a large number in itself, but compared to the number of youth that apply. I mean, <laughs> How do you choose one over another? Um, some of the grant programs have specific requirements, so they need to qualify for the program, and it's typically on a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, there's a documented need for youth jobs. Many youth are not adequately prepared with the basic skills and competencies needed to succeed in the workforce and to become economic, economically self-sufficient. 
Um, in the future, the possibilities are endless. There's a lot we can do with the programs and the youth in our community. Uh, with further resources, we can put on more programs, provide more training, uh, provide more services, build more partnerships, and um, ultimately offer more opportunities for the youth of, youth of our community. That concludes my report. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Karina, if you, if you could just, um, because Commissioner Ruffo had the question about grants, just kind of spell out some of the various grants that you do get, where they're coming from, the money. Sure. Um, our grants vary, especially for the summer program, but majority of our funding comes from the Workforce Investment Board. It's the WIA funds, Workforce Im Investment Act and that operates our team and EIP program for the younger and older youth. Um, we have funding from United Way, from CDBG, um, and for the summer, last year we had ARA funds. This year our funding came from uh, South Bay WIB and LA County. That varies year to year, um, and depending on the grants that we have, the qualifications for the program also change, and the processes change. Was there, was there any stimulus money? Yeah, the ARA um, funds. Last year, 2009-10, uh, we received, I believe, 410000 to operate summer youth employment program, and that was all ARA uh, funds. I believe the funding for this summer came, is, the original source is ARA funds as well, um, but it was funneled through L.A. County and South Bay WIB. And I believe these are all grants that, that you you go after. It's not like it's coming in. And Don and, and staff really go after these grants. Our WIA grants are um, once every three years. We reapply for funding, but CDBG is annual. United Way is every other year, every two years or so. Karina, uh, are the WIA grants competitive or are those entitlement funds? No, they're competitive. They are competitive. Yes. Okay. So all, all the grants are based on a competitive grant application. In fact, one of the challenges for 1011 will be um, summer employment uh, funding because at this point it doesn't look like the federal government will be providing funding for next summer. Uh, but we're, we're hoping that changes, but, but it might be a big challenge for next year. And that's really, from my experience with 2IA, that's really the most important program. Mm -hmm. The summer. The summer. And, and my hat's off to Karina and her staff because I didn't realize until, you know, the program was under me that you have 350 youth. Um, there's also personnel issues associated with that as well in terms of the hiring. And then, sure. and then like any other, you know, full-time organization, you put just about just as much time in personnel issues as you do in a full-time yeah. organization. Interpersonal so, relationships and things like it, that, yeah. So, I mean, and it goes most of it goes very smoothly. So my hat's off to her. Thank you. I think this is such an important program because it really does give youth an opportunity to move into the workforce and to learn the things that make a successful employee, being, on work on, being at work on time, dressing appropriately, whatever that is, all the things that, um, that they need to be successful as an adult. So I really congratulate you on this program. Thank it's you. a great program. Thank you. One last thing. I think that one of the the biggest successes that GYA has had over the years is with the really the young adults and the kids that you put into some of the city positions that then stay on with either parks or public works or whatever the department is and then they become outstanding employees I think in those departments year after year. Absolutely. I think we have how many graduates? We have two at redevelopment, aren't you? We have quite a few yeah. <laughs> youth around the city, but we have at least one or two permanent employees in almost every department. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Item 5A7, update on nonprofit study. Yeah, and it seems like we're giving you more and more more doses of human services, community services programs, but that's, you know, our focus at this point, that and recreation, of course. But uh, Teresa has a report on, on uh, what we, we're looking into helping nonprofits uh, as much as we can as a city. You know, what can we do to help um, 
empower them to, to help them function better. If there's anything we can do, we'll certainly try. And, and Teresa, Jess, and a few others have been meeting with nonprofits, and, and she has a report to give to you about that. Great. Good afternoon, President Khan, members of the Commission staff, and the public viewing at home. My name is Teresa Alexania, an administrative analyst with the Community Services and Parks Department. Uh, per council direction, staff met with um, nonprofits to find out how the city can be more supportive to the nonprofits to increase their capacity to operate and uh, provide services to the community. And per that direction, we met with the executive coalition, which is a group of um, directors from nonprofits, local, uh, some of the major ones, about 25 that are part of this coalition. Uh, to find out what type of services and programs the nonprofits would like to see the city offer. Um, along the same line, staff met internally to, to discuss and find out what are some of the capacity issues that we find uh, working with the nonprofits throughout the years that um, we could try to help them out with, and also the type of services that we already provide to the nonprofits. So I'll start off with the feedback that we received from the Executive Coalition. The first, we initially met with the Executive Coalition, got some feedback, did an initial feasibility study, and then went back to meet with the Coalition to offer some feedback on um, you know, the, the costs associated with some of the services and to, get a, uh, to ask them to prioritize some of the services and programs that they requested. And the feedback that we received, we broke that down into four categories between empl employee development, technical assistance, marketing and promotions, and coordination. Within employee development, the nonprofits would like to see the city offer and make available the human resource employee development uh, workshops or classes that we offer to uh, city employees like diversity training, supervisory academy, sexual harassment. Um, also, they'd like to uh, be able to benefit from the life scan and fingerprinting services that the city offers, so they'd like for the city to be able to provide life scan, fingerprinting, and background checks for the employees and volunteers of nonprofits. Both of these are um, programs and services that we're currently researching um, with the with legal department, a legal opinion on what would be the liability of opening up this sure. Uh, these programs and, and are offering background checks to um, for the nonprofits. Uh, the second area category was technical assistance, and they'd like to see grant um, grant research assistance, not grant writing, but research. So finding available grants out there that would uh, benefit the different organizations. Uh, topical capacity building workshops. So whether it's board development or um, fundraising or those type of workshops that uh, their staff or executives can benefit from, and information on city, city statistics and demographics that they could use for their grant applications. Some of these we already provide, and I'll touch base on those when I get to services that we already provide, and, um, and or we're researching to see what the feasibility would be of offering that, whether it's cost or staff. The, under marketing and promotions, um, they'd like to be able to use GTV6, the public access channel, and um, ask that GTV6 help them promote and advertise maybe 15-second PSAs that they could run on GTV6 to advertise the services that are um, offered by the nonprofits. Uh, along the same lines, they initially asked for GWP mailers, so mailers that go out in the GWP mail. Um, bills that go out, but we only have six mails a year, and that's really limited to currently city departments, and it would be really hard to offer that, and so when we went back to them, they decided that that wasn't one of the priorities, so we're not going to concentrate on that for now. Under coordination, they would like for the city um, to be to list the, the nonprofits that currently offer services to the Glendale community. Um, and again, our youth and family staff, Walter uh, Alvarez, is currently working on that, and I'll touch base on that. Um, they'd like for the city to maintain a needs list for all the nonprofits and also list volunteer opportunities that the public would be able to access, maybe online. So these are the feedback that we've received on um, the type of services that they'd like to, additional services that they'd like to see from the city. Feedback from the staff, um, based on staff experience on the many years with CDBG and with Walter working with the youth and family and referring uh, parents and youth to the nonprofits, um, we've been able to pull together some capacity issues that we've identified. 
And some of the issues identified were fund development, employee development, board development, financial management, quality staff, um, quality financial management systems. A lot of them don't have the, the system to be able to manage their, their financials. And high turnover. It seems like um, one or two key, uh, key people within the organization or the organization is um, dependent on one or two key staff, and so whether it's a board member or a director, and so when that person leaves, the, the capacity of the organization reduces and they're not able to function. So these are some um, capacity issues that staff has identified that we'd like to be able to help um, the nonprofits with. Currently, the city provides uh, quite a few services and programs to the nonprofits, some that they may be aware of and some that they may not be aware of, and hopefully through this process they will know that it's available to them. Uh, the availability of demographic and statistical information, that's one of the items that they did request, and currently it may not be centralized, but it is available. Our CDBG section um, has census data that's available to all the nonprofits that could contact the CDBG section and request the information, and it will be provided. Also, our community planning department um, has statistical and demographic information on the website, and also they could contact the department to be able to pull information from whether it's the quality of life report or just uh, statistical information that's published on the website for their uh, grant applications. Capacity building workshops. Um, we currently offer, Walter Alvarez and, and his staff um, currently offer uh, quarterly workshops and he's working with the nonprofits to find out what are the type of topics that they'd like to hear, uh, that they'd like to see offered. Um, Go, and there was one offered earlier this year, Fundraising 101, and I know he's working on um, offering a second workshop and uh, hopefully you know, being able to bring in funding to offer more. So these are the, the type of workshops that we, our staff offers already. But there's also um, the CDBG section who offers uh, workshops and and actually uh, not just the workshops but they offer uh, a ma they email uh, a, li a mailing list that they have they email to uh, the nonprofits workshops that are offered by nonprofit organization professional organizations that type that provide these type of um, workshops like the Center for Nonprofit the uh, VNR Valley uh, nonprofit resources, Flintridge um, Operating Foundation. These are nonprofits that are out there that already provide um, technical assistance and capacity building workshops that are available to the nonprofits, whether it's at a minimum cost or no cost. So CDBG does have a mailing list of over 100 organizations that they email out if, when, they, when they do find out that these type of workshops are available. But also the nonprofits could go to the website for these organizations and find out what workshops are out there that will benefit it and help them increase their capacity and be able to uh, operate on a higher level. Um, CDBG, the, the Community Development Block Grant, um, Emergency Shelter Grant, and the Supportive Housing Program also offer uh, technical assistance programs to um, grantees of these grants. So uh, they they. The type of classes or workshops that they do offer are uh, how to write a competitive funding proposal, preparing budgets, uh, marketing, develop, developing outcomes, intake and eligibility. So these are the type of things that they could they help out um, with those organizations, nonprofits that are receiving a grant from the uh, from from these uh, grantees, grantors, CDBG, ESG, and SHP. For centralized coordination, uh, social services um, Glendale resource guide is available on the city's website. So Walter Alvarez has made available the, the resource guide for social services. It's a list of all the organizations that provide. They may not all be Glendale-based organizations, but they provide services to the Glendale community. So these organizations are available on the youth and family website, and we're currently um, trying to provide direct linkage on the websites to the nonprofits. So we're working on uh, making that available online so that the public could, once they find the organization, can link directly to the organization and find out more on how to, um, how to gain the, the assistance that they need. Um, also for um, an additional service that we do offer at the city is uh, 
reduced fees for use of city facilities. I know our department, Community Services and Parks, provides a 25% discount um, on rental of our facilities to nonprofits, and then it's 50% for the civic, but majority of the facilities are 25%. The library also provides a discount for facilities. It varies, the rate varies depending on if it's a Glendale based nonprofit or a non Glendale based. We also have a special event um, policy and depending on the type of uh, sponsorship, whether it's co-sponsorship or endorsement or sponsorship, there's different levels of uh, discounts that may be offered to the nonprofits that request that from the city of Glendale. So these are the type of um, services that we already do provide to the nonprofits and it's available currently. We, staff is working with, um, on a potential partnership with organizations like the Valley Nonprofit Resource or the Flint Ridge Operating Center. We're currently meeting with the different organiza organizations to find out if we could have a potential partnership where instead of the city creating these workshops or programs or services that we could offer, if we could maybe partner with them and have them offer these services, maybe at, um, at, at a low cost and maybe the city can uh, pay for part of that and have them offer these workshops versus duplicating efforts and creating these workshops or and or services that we could provide to the nonprofits. So once we are um, done with completing our feasibility study, we would like to take a report to council with a recommendation on the type of programs and services or technical assistance capacity building workshops we uh, could provide for the nonprofits and we will come back to commission with the report and a recommendation to take to council once we um, find out what that is and based on council approval we would we also may be recommending a joint um, uh, a joint commission with the Parks, Recreation and Community Services and the CDBG Advisory Committee a um, joint meeting maybe quarterly where the both commissions would um, serve together and and listening to the nonprofits and uh, evaluating the efficiency of the program whatever it may be that that is offered and um, overseeing the implementation of the program and receiving reports and that type of stuff so instead of creating a separate commission maybe bringing the two commissions together because they we, we, both commissions already work with the nonprofits and and have experience with that. There's currently no budget, or it's not budgeted. Um, so the ad additional services or programs that we would offer, we'd have to look at the um, the cost and and where we would be able to find funding. So council would have to identify based on the type of service or the level of service where we do offer to the nonprofits. So we will come back at a later date. But this was a brief. Um, report on the, the, the nonprofit feasibility study we're doing and uh, what we hope to get out of it. So if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'd be more than happy to answer. Maybe um, it, it sounds like what you're creating is, um, I don't mean this negatively, but sort of like a laundry list of things to help out nonprofits. Is there an, like an overriding goal that says what we would like to do is, I don't know, get more of them, have them more, be more successful financially? I mean, how are you going to measure whether what you're doing has been good or bad? Well, one of the ways we could measure is if we're going to provide grant, for example, one of the things that they've requested is grant, re uh, grant research. So one of the ways we could measure outcome is um, we could look at how many grants we were able to, to assist the nonprofits with and, and um, how much money we were able to help them bring in to the nonprofits. And or, um, you know, if we provide the, the workshops that we provide for technical assistance or capacity building, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that this would help the nonprofits uh, operate on a, on a higher level and, and be able to manage their financials a little better and overall that means that they would provide a better service to the community. So I think each individual, depending on what it is that we offer, we'd be able to measure results um, within within that category. So I mean, you know, if it's grant research, then you measure how many grants you're able to help them bring in. Of course, it means, you know, it may mean uh, an additional staff person because it takes a, a lot of work to tra track and maintain, but it, you know, depending on um, 
the, the study and how much we're, we're able to dedicate as far as budget and uh, the partnerships, if we're able to work with the nonprofits. For example, if we're not able to open up our human resource, de uh, the human resource employee development classes, we might be able to partner up with one of the nonprofit organizations that provides a similar workshop. So those are kind of some of the ways that, I mean, open to George well, and Jeff. It really is. It's, it, the goal is... The goal is capacity building, and, and how do we help them yeah. with with that? And, and, and Teresa's right; it's you know, what's the baseline? How many people are they serving now? And with this help, yeah. uh, w how many more can they serve? And those type of things we'll, we'll be able to measure. Okay. Yes. In, in addition to the fundraising, of course, that, right. that goes without saying. You know, and maybe besides uh, taking some of the seminars that the city offers our staff. Maybe also going out to some of the major corporations that are headquartered in uh, or that have major offices here in Glendale that are giving seminars and ask them if they would extend it to some of the nonprofits. You know, there's three or four major companies that come to mind already. Okay. So. Yeah, I just think that this is a, a really important thing that the city can do. Um, it's, a, it's very efficient and very effective because we reach out to a finite number of organizations, but then they reach out into the community. And if we can help them grow their capacity, we're reaching so many more members of the community than, than we would be able to do on our own if we were responsible for all this. So I think it's really important and great that you're, that you're looking at these very all various alternatives. Um, a couple of things that, that came to mind. Um, I know that this meeting that the executive directors do is a, a way that they communicate with each other and help each other. And that might be a way that if city staff could attend those meetings maybe not every month but every other month to talk about what the city does offer. Um, as you say, staff can turn over pretty rapidly in nonprofits, and so the fact that that this particular group knows that you can get um, statistics from the city from these various departments, you know, by two months from now, they've turned over enough that 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 a reminder of where I mean that that. Um, memory that goes on in organizations can get lost pretty quickly. And so perhaps there's a way that a staff member could, could attend with a five or ten minute presentation about something that the city has available that, the organ, that all of the organizations don't know about. So that would help coordinate it. And I also think that, that a, a fairly um, inexpensive and effective way is this web presence. and. And if people know they can come to the city website, just like they can come to the city website and be directed to businesses in the city and the chamber through the Chamber of Commerce, if they can come to the city and then have some kind of a link where they can get to the various nonprofits, that seems like a, a really good idea to me, too. So I would certainly encourage you to, to keep on with, with this and to come up with some, some good ideas for Council. I, I think they would be supportive of this. One of the other things I, I, I'd like to see is if, if the commission is agreeable, I know our, our, our agenda is fairly full, is give nonprofits maybe five minutes, you know, spotlight on a nonprofit once a month or so, and they can come talk about what they do. And if they have a PowerPoint, I think that helps. I think we talked about possibly doing that as well. That way, the, between GTV6 and, and getting the word out here, at least it gives them more exposure, plus the web. I think that's a great idea. Good idea. I would be very interested in, in having Doing that, that. Okay. happen. The other thing I think we should do, though, is look at prioritizing, because there's a number of different things that you listed. I think the very near the top, if not the top, should be financial management, because my experience with nonprofits has been, you know, you've got to have your books in order that, to even qualify for the grants, and usually some of the people that are working at the nonprofits are not the highest paid people and that accounting aspect of it sometimes isn't that exciting to do and gets pushed aside and that's one thing the second thing is fundraising i mean any nonprofit that's that's one of the key key issues for their survival is fundraising so i mean to be able to to kind of not only add on to what you said but to be able to say okay this is what you guys should be spending your energy and your attention on, especially 
in, until you get a solid foundation with the fundraising and a solid foundation with your accounting and then start looking at some of the other things. Because from my experience the last few years with, um, with PATH Achieve Glendale, that's exactly what we did. I mean, it seemed like everything was in order, and it was not. And until we, we dedicated the time and the resources to, to doing straightening that out, it, 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 was, it was not going in a good direction. Once we did that, it just kind of shot, it, it just took off from there. So from my experience, that would be, it would be nice to prioritize those items. Right. So, and those are the type of workshops I think that we'd be looking to offer with, um, whether it's individually through youth and family, whether it's the city doing it or with a partnership with one of the nonprofits that already offers such workshops and also one-on-one -on -one assistance. So those are, I, I think, important points that you point out. And we, we have heard, and I think staff that has experience with the nonprofits has also identified that as one of the major capacity issues. Great. Yeah, and as you know, board development is also important. I sure. mean, you and, and uh, Nick serve on that board, you're dynamic. And if you have a dynamic board, that really does help with your fundraising, too, in terms of reaching out and your organization. Just piggybacking on something that George said about, you know, putting on our agenda, you know, a, a five-minute presentation from a nonprofit. I think the nonprofits also need to be reminded that they can go to council or the women's commission or the arts commission, whatever the um, whatever their focus is, and during oral communications, do a five-minute presentation, you know, on whatever it is that they're talking about that month. I would like to see them, though, be on the agenda. Right. I'm, I'm just saying, I, yes, I, I agree. People I'd love to see them on at. our agenda. Yeah. But it's, for instance, it's not real easy to get on a city council agenda. But if they have a three-minute presentation, um, you know, they can get on, er on the early oral communications. And yeah. That's a really good idea because, I mean, we're so accustomed to being, you know, knowing that we can do that. You know, people who regularly go to the city council meetings, maybe not a lot of nonprofits know that they can come up there and do that. So it could be part of what we offer. Or know what the procedure is Protocol to get a is. PowerPoint presentation right. submitted in time to get shown and things right. like that. Right. Great point. Great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Good job. Item 5A8, Irrigation Report. Gary Marillo. Sorry, no time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, President Kahn and the rest of the commissioners, uh, there's been some confusion about the irrigation watering of the Parks Department, so I'm going to clear up a little bit of the uh, confusion, maybe be able to tell the people at home also what, how we do it and why we do it. Uh, first, let me start off with saying that the uh, the recycled water is not part of the ordinance. There is absolutely, it is absolutely exempt from the ordinance. And we have 13 facilities on recycled water. You, you were all given a sheet of paper that has that list on there of all the parks, and the ones in yellow are the ones that are on recycled water. We tried to uh, sign every park or every facility that is on recycled water so people will understand. But there is no, um, there is a complete exemption for that. You can water any time of the day any day of the week, and any amount of time you want to. And in fact, uh, I've been encouraged by a water department to use more recycled water. Uh, I can't really do that because it's not free. It still costs me money. It doesn't cost me quite as much. And um, if I can get a few more facilities on it or if they can uh, change the infrastructure to add some more on there, I would be more than happy to use it. I would love to have all every facility we have on recycled water. But as of this point right now, we only have 13. Four of them are medians. One of them is very large medium. Median or two are Glendale Avenue and Glen Oaks Boulevard are both uh, recycled water. The um, other ones you can see on your list, the Adult Recreation Center, Brand Park, Cerritos Park, Civic Auditorium, Glen Oaks Park, Pacific Edison, Pelanconi, both Shoal Canyon, the ball fields, and the park are under it, and then the uh, four medians. Um, we water, the ordinance says three days a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Uh, we went met with the water department because it does not really work for the parks department. We will water three days a week, but Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays do not work because of one simple reasoning that we're not staffed heavily on the weekends. So if we water Saturday morning and something breaks at 2 o'clock in the morning, 
the chances of that one individual who's running around opening 10 parks in that one area is probably not going to find it. And who's going to find it as the public or when it starts running down the street or as it's getting down to, in, into the sewer, somebody will eventually call on that. We could have gone 10, 12, 14 hours without ever noticing that. Whereas we have changed our watering to uh, Monday mornings, Wednesday mornings, and Friday mornings. Usually around from midnight to uh, <coughs> 6 a.m. because we want to finish around 6 because of the, the work that's going to be starting on the lawns and whatnot and the people who come to use the park to walk on it and run their dogs and uh, recreate in the mornings. But we found out that there's always enough staff here on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the mornings to catch that because everything is, is uh, if it's not fully staffed, it's at least uh, staffed half or partly to, so every, every facility has somebody checking the entire facility as opposed to just opening a restroom, cleaning up the trash and leaving and going to the next one. So that's one of the reasons we, we, don't, we do not water on the city's mandated schedule. But we do try very, very hard to water three days a week. On your sheet of paper that you've got, you'll see some exceptions. Montrose Mall is one. Um, Montrose Mall has some very small turf areas that slope down to the street. If I water more than about five minutes at a time, five minutes, if I water ten minutes at a time, five minutes of that water is going to run down to the curb. So we water usually twice a night. So, or we'll run over five days a week, five minutes, to get enough water on the, on the lawn to, uh, to grow and to flourish, but not and so much water that will run over the curb and, and flood out the street. Then I'll have uh, another problem in the street, probably standing water as well as running water. And I don't want either one of those. Um, the certain times of the year, it's, it's watered differently also. August and September are our ball field renova renovation times. We sod anywhere from three to five pallets to I have up to 14 pallets of sod going in a year. That can't be watered three days a week. It will die. It's Bermuda grass. It's 100 degrees. And we usually resod Stengel Field, Dunsmore, Babe Herman. Uh, those are the main ones. We, we uh, Montrose Mall, another one, another big one. All out in the sun, all fully uh, in the weather. And to get sod to root properly, you have to water it two to three days, or two to three times per day for about a 10-day period. Then it roots, and then you can start to back it off. So in those times of the year, August and September, you, they will see water running more often than they would uh, at any other, any other times of the day. And it could be potable water, and it very likely will be at, at Verdugo Park, especially Stengel. There is no recycled water at Verdugo Park or Stengel because of the uh, aquifer underneath. So that's potable water. Um, we try to monitor it as well as possible, but Mother Nature is kind of the guide. If she's hot with the, sod, with the new sod, we have to water more. We don't want to lose the money we put into that or lose the sod for the ball, ball players. Um, mainly the sprinklers are um, the ones that are regulated for the 10 minutes anyway are the ones that are spray heads, not necessarily the rotor heads. The rotor heads shoot 20, 30, 40 feet and cover a very large swath and put out approximately the same amount of water that a spray head does that only covers 10 or 15 feet. They, um, they take approximately two minutes to do a full, complete rotation to go one way and then come back the other way. They're meant to put water down slower to cover a larger area and to get better, better infiltration. They do not flood near as well or near as, um, have the propensity to flood near as much as the uh, the spray heads, which are a constant spraying of water for 10 or 12 minutes, and you can get a, a real good flood with those uh, spray heads. We have uh, we've done a, a number of things to save water, um, and my um, the the division spent in 2008 and 2009 994 thousand dollars on utilities, uh, give or take a few dollars. And in 2009-2010, we spent 140000 less uh, on utilities, and that was due to basically everybody concentrating on water. We went out of the Motorola system to the Hunter system, which is a less sophisticated but more user-friendly system. So everybody out there can actually dial it down daily, uh, depending upon what the water needs are for the park. So that's... Uh, 
like I said, we were very happy and encouraged that we were able to save that much. Mother Nature gave us a hand with some extra water last year, but uh, we'll see what happens this next year. But we're doing the same thing. And even a, the uh, controllers that we have, can, you can reduce it by 1%, 2 3%, 10%, 60%. So even a couple percentage down for 40 facilities uh, creates quite a savings, even if you're just dialing it down a few percents. So uh, hopefully, if, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I do. So you're getting a lot of calls. Is this why we're getting this update? Or Yes, a lot of people are calling in saying you're watering at the wrong time, you're not watering with the ordinance. We are. We're trying to follow the ordinance to the letter as much as we can. Some instances, like I've mentioned, are different, but uh, um, they have to understand that recycled water is not part of that. And we are fallible. I mean, there's a broken valve, uh, sure. st stuck head, clock malfunction. Whenever we're alerted to that, it's less than 24-hour notice that, that, we're, that we're out there fixing it or turning it off. Uh, we have a weekend supervisor, Armin, who's outstanding. He can, I can call him any time when I get a call. He'll go out there and just shut it off for the time being. But uh, those are the things we want to prevent uh, or get to as fast as possible. We fix them as quickly as possible. We have three dedicated building repairmen that are dedicated to irrigation. Is there a clarification other than what you're doing right now? So those people that aren't fascinated and tuning in to our... Park, or Parks Commission, this the recycled water use is not restricted by the water use ordinance. You know how you guys send out mailers? Or this, send is, out this will updates. be on the website. This will or be on the website. So, so anybody who wants to go to the website will see this. They'll have the same exact paper that you've got on your hands right now, all highlighted where the recycled water ones are, and with the, uh, with the, the comments along the edge to, for, to telling them if they see it in August and, or August in Stenglefield at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if they've looked at this at all, they'll have an idea that, okay, it's the middle of summer, they just resawed it, that's what it says right here. Okay. I think also, even though I understood it when you said it, it should be clarified that we're not using recycled water at the Casa Adobe or, uh, you know, Griffith Manor Park or whatever, because there's no pipes with recycled water going to those areas, correct? Correct, yeah. There's so we want to use it. Correct, definitely. We just don't have the infrastructure taking it to these sites that are not getting it at this time. The city ran quite a bit of recycled water piping about 10, 15 years ago up to Brand Park, up to Shoal Canyon. They ran them down, the, down through Glen Oaks Boulevard. They ran it up, through, up Grandview, the middle of Grandview Boulevard, up to the top and all the way down Glen Oaks to Alameda. They ran it all the way there, but they didn't run it every, obviously, it's expensive to run it everywhere. So wherever they ran it by, we were able to tap into it. But um, unfortunately, I'm not able to tap into all of it. And we still want to do that. I would still like to do that. I think it would be a great savings. And I've seen no problems in, with, re with recycled or reclaimed water in the past 15 years. Right. So. But I just want, you know, because people will say, Gee, why aren't you using it at the Bicentennial Park? You know, but they should, they need to know where you would use it, except that there is no pipe taking it there. There's no piping there right now. Yeah. And I think we, you know, we understand the residents have certain days that they can water, and, and, and the frustration is they see, sometimes they see sprinklers on in our parks, uh, and they're not allowed to, to have their, their sprinklers on. It's either a broken uh, valve or, or something that went wrong, or a different uh, irrigation schedule just because it needs to be done that way. We just have some dry spots. I think sometimes Gary has to overwater sure. uh, so that at least we keep the parks green, the medians green, or else they dry out. Also, so, you know, we have to, when we do our repairs, it's, all, it's during the day. So when after a guy has, has the work order to do a repair, he goes out and he checks it to make sure nothing else is broken. We can't do that in the middle of the night or, you know, or early morning. So you have to do that in, during the day when you can actually see the system on. And typically, the clock is, oh, 200 feet from the nearest sprinkler head. So he goes over to the clock and flips it on and stands there and watches it from the clock to see how everything's working. A person will drive in the park and not see anybody there and think the water is on, when in reality, they're actually checking the system after a fix or a repair to see, make sure so they can close it out and go to the next one. 
I think the majority of the people, though, if once it's communicated to them, they kind of get it. That's what I wanted to say. Just tell them, that, let them know that you know we're trying our, our best to, to comply. We are complying. It's just not exactly the way that they're complying. I think. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for me. Item five A nine reforestation of Upper Shoal Canyon Park. Okay. It would be me again. Uh, you have a small report in your in your packet. On this, uh, I talked about it back in July when we met. Uh, it was just in its infancy at that time. We hadn't gone very far yet. Um, I have a little bit more clear object of what's happening now. We've um, we've cleared 70 trees on that hillside and the adjacent parkways and six up in Shoal Canyon Park. They're all dead or dying, malformed, mis uh, misformed, diseased, whatever the the cause may have been. We, we moved about 70 of them. The hillside is now fairly barren. What's left is what's still good. Um, the Parks Department will be going up there in the next couple of weeks, uh, myself included, uh, with my building repair manager. We're going to put it three new irrigation lines up at the top of the hill that will support drip irrigation. And we'll set it up to water the new trees and the existing ones. But we won't run the lines yet until they're planted. We finished, we hope to finish the, the um, irrigation by the end of October and then by the 15th or possibly sooner depending on the weather but by the 15th of November the uh, the replanting should start. Uh, West Coast Arbors is the company we've chosen to do that with. They'll be planting anywhere from 35 to 55 trees back in that and they'll all be of different varieties than are, than are up there right now for fire retardation and for water conservation. Eventually those Drip lines can probably be abandoned at some point because they won't need the water after maybe three years of, of establishment. They'll be able to assist on their own. Uh, right after the replanting, which will take probably approximately 30 days, maybe as, they, as they're going in blocks, we're going to come behind them in blocks and run the tubing for the irrigation. And then right after they're all done with all that, they're going to, after we take pictures of where the tubing goes, we're going to put three to four inches of mulch on top of that and cover everything up that's, that's exposed. That'll help both the moisture retention, rodent problem that could chew on the, the, the tubings and would cause problems, um, UV light that'll cause a problem sometimes with the, with the, even with the black. Uh, and with the drop that they'll, with, with the droppage of the oaks that we put up there and the uh, scrub oaks, the toyons, possibly, but this, that drop will just continue to mulch itself after the bark does go away. Bark will take a couple of years to decompose, at least. But we, at that point, then they'll have you'll have a, a canopy to cover up the soil, and it won't be a, as much of a problem as it is right now. It's, it'll be wide open right now. There'll be probably 15 gallon sized trees that'll be staked up there. So, that's yeah. good. And that sounds good as well. Thank you. Item 5A10, monthly activity reports at A, Park Services. <laughs> Just ball field renovations have been going on primarily the last month or two. We've been trying to get the ball fields uh, back up to snuff after the season. So basically that's where we've been focusing on. That's why the water was so, uh, so important this time of the year too. And also, I may want to I may add that uh, of a previous report that I gave, a good time to plant your your um, uh, drought tolerant plants. A good time to start your garden is right now, or within the next month or so. Take advantage of the winter rains. The um, this isn't directly related, but the turf, the astroturf that's been put out in the <laughs> courtyard area. Well, what's the what's the latest on that? It's still there. Um, obviously, it's. It, we want to <laughs> go a, through. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. well, thank you, Gary. We. Uh, that, that's good. No, well, it's. Uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just meant to be for a full season, a full twelve months, to see how it holds up under flooded conditions, hot conditions, uh, people to step on it, touch it, walk on it, look at it, take pictures of it you know, run their hands through it, whatever, and at some point the city council will say, okay, we've, we've you know, public comment time on this. What do you think? And that's up to them. We just, we'll just have it as long as they want it. 
And for folks watching at home, this is this, this was something we did with the planning department. Correct. It's really for front lawns. I think they're looking at will they, you know, can they use artificial turf on the front lawn and what looks real and what doesn't. And what, how long has it been out there now? It's been out there approximately nine months, I yeah. think. Eight, 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 about eight months, maybe closer to the middle of winter, late winter, and went out there. And or maybe it was last year or later. It could be even closer to a year, but it's it's getting close to the its cycle of how what it what it was wor- out there for. And then you can see how it how it went through the summer, how it went through the winter time with all the water, and see how it actually looks now. And like like George said, uh, it's it was looked at for front lawns because right now there's an ordinance that says you can't have it in your front lawn. And they're look, thinking about changing that or thinking about looking to. He augment that because it is a water-saving device. I mean, it's a large water-saving device. So are we wanting people to give feedback or just to, to observe it? Observe it and feedback if they, if, they, if they have a comment. We're not taking up planning as the lead, is the lead okay. Uh, okay. agency on that one. Great. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Item 5A10B, Recreation and Community Services. President Kahn and Commissioners, uh, we had a very successful summer. Uh, if you take a look at our Parks Creating Futures participation, our attendance was up. Uh, we attribute that to a lot of people basically staying home for the summer and not traveling as much. Uh, but all, every one of our sites were up except for Maple Park because, as we know, that's under construction. Uh, all our camp programs, um, when we're, we're somewhat competing with ourselves. Our Camp Express program, which is our normal operations where we'll go to Dunsmore, Verduga Park, um, uh, Brand Park, this, the attendance was slightly down, but again, we compete within ourselves because we've offered some extra camps here and there throughout the city at Pacific. And uh, Community Center, their camps are up. But all in all, our camp registration was up. Uh, our uh, after-school care, after-camp care, prior to camp care was also increased. So there is obviously a need for people utilizing uh, care before and after for their work schedules. Um, we had some terrific uh, new camps this summer, which we're excited about. We had a kinder camp for the first time over at Pacific Community Center. That was successful and extremely loud, and the kids had a great time. <laughs> and you could tell as, as they all, kids all got used to each other and the teachers all got used to the kids, it got extremely loud at that facility. So kids were having a great time, and parents were extremely pleased with the program, so we're really happy with that. We know we'll be back with it next year. Hope to expand it. The traveling teen camp, this was one of our successes. Uh, it, we've we've tra- tried to do it for years. Uh, we've had the opportunity from time to time, and, and, and we've done okay with it. it. It fluctuates back and forth. This one was really exciting because we decided to use the bus lines to get the kids places. Uh, we t- went all over this, all, all over Glendale. Um, they went to scavenger hunts, the movie theaters. They went to the bowling alley. They visited the police and the fire departments. Um, they went up to Hoover High School for uh, the swimming program because we have Hoover as one of our swim locations. And one of the highlights was the opportunity to um, hike up at Brand Park. So they take the bus so far, they walk up the rest, and then they hike up at Brand Park. And this is the first time eight of those kids have ever been hiking in their life. So they had just an absolute ball. And they're excited to do it again. And so we anticipate that this is a camp that also will come back because it gave kids an opportunity to see what's in Glendale and utilize what's in Glendale for the summer. So that was nice. Uh, the summer moonlight movies and the summer concert series are again a bang up success. Um, uh, we've reported to you before that our movies are expanding within the community. We're working with the historical society, we're working with the uh, 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 different community groups. Uh, we had national, we had our, one of our movies was involved in National Night Out. So with our summer series, with the expansion of our movies, we're doing quite well with the movie series and it's well received within the community and we've got some terrific movies that we uh, have on a regular basis. So it's kind of fun. Uh, the summer concert, again, uh, we had a very successful summer concert series. Uh, terrific music, terrific bands. Uh, some repeat bands and people look forward to that so they know when they're coming and they're checking our websites out now so they take a look and see when they're going to be playing and they're there. Uh, A lot of good family activity. The playground is usually packed every single night. 
And then, of course, we had Shakespeare in the Park. We expanded the Shakespeare in the Park to four, five, three, four, five, five. We had five Shakespeare in the Park this year. I think we had a couple last year. And Shakespeare in the Park is, again, very successful and very well uh, uh, attended by the community. It's a spe specific uh, uh, audience. And, but they, they follow it, they know when it's coming, and they're regulars that attend them. We tried a couple different uh, facilities this time. We've, we, I'm sorry, it was four. I said five. It was four. Uh, all, all well received. The first one uh, was a little low in attendance, but that was because our, the publicity was a little lacking. It was just getting right off the start with summer. Usually a lot of our summer activities to start off with are slow, and then they pick up as people realize that, hey, this is really going to go on. And then, of course, we had our quarterly uh, reports and our customer service monthly reports, uh, and then our civics auditorium monthly rental report. Uh, Ross Ferris is in the audience if we have any questions regarding any of those reports that you have. And then we have all our upcoming activities that are coming up for the month of uh, September and just the uh, first week in August. And we're excited to offer some new ones, so we're thrilled with Parents' Night Out is coming back to SPAR. Uh, we have a, the Fall Film Festival over at Adams Square, which is going to be October 1st. And then we have Unity Fest. Georgie, we might want to talk a little bit about that on October 10th. And then we have a Teen Equinox coming up October 15th, which is one of the four Teen Equinoxes that we have during the year. And that's it. If you have any questions, be happy to answer, or Ross may help us. You guys have questions? No? Nope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots going on. Yeah. Item 5A10C, CIP projects. George. Um, we um, just had a couple of the highlights uh, to bring to your attention. Um, working on, uh, currently working on the <coughs> Griffith Manor renovation, so that's pretty much gearing up for uh, you know, all the mobilization and things like this, so they're at the very beginning of that project. And as uh, a lot of you were present at the uh, uh, groundbreaking ceremony that went off again uh, very nicely, and uh, uh, I think we're going to we're looking forward. I think the community out in that area is looking forward to this facility uh, becoming a reality. They uh, a lot of them actually call it the flower flower park, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, you know Griffith Manor has been a long time in coming and. Uh, we're real pleased to be uh, actively involved with that. And uh, Shahin Begomian is uh, putting a lot of energies into making sure that comes off uh, on time and uh, in budget. So uh, um, Maple Park uh, revitalization project is uh, uh, well underway. Uh, we're probably around, uh, I think, about 24 percent probably completion. Uh, we're still actively doing uh, selective demolition, but uh, we have uh, block walls coming up now on the easterly uh, ex uh, expansion area. So uh, if you drive by, you will actually see now we're out of the ground. Uh, a lot of time and effort uh, that Audrene uh, Golnazarian is putting in on that to uh, address the current as-built conditions and then uh, transition the new extension expansion area into it really uh, nicely. So it, it'll, it's coming along very well. Um, I believe uh, Hagop Kasabian has just started uh, gearing up again up at the uh, Wilderness Park on the barn uh, re um, renovation, the, the seismic stabilization phase for the Duke Majin barn. So uh, they're uh, in the beginning of that project as well. So they're uh, pl planning out and starting to work on the utilities and uh, some selective demolition as well there. So we're real excited about having that, uh, that project uh, underway. And uh, the Pacific Pool project is currently out to bid. So uh, bids close. Uh, in uh, the following month, so uh, it's out to bid. We've had our pre-bid um, meeting on that as already, and uh, Peter uh, Fairheilig is uh, again monitoring that and uh, looking forward to uh, getting that project rolling. So those are our, kind of our main highlighted uh, items at this time. The barn. You want to mention the barn? 
the barn. Could, yeah. The uh, Wilderness Park barn. Um, like I said, that's the one that Hogup is currently working on um, with, uh, with the um, um, Tomco construction. And um, like I said, they're just at the very beginning of that project, so uh, we're getting, getting going with that. He had mentioned it. He mentioned it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. At the groundbreaking for Griffith Manor Park, Council Member Weaver was talking about a dog run or a dog park in the back. Is that? We're, we're going to look at it. We are going to come back and, and uh, look at the cost of doing that. and. Uh, it, it may change the drawings a little bit. We will probably need some irrigation for um, a fountain out there for the dogs. Um, but again, there's some issues with large dogs, small dog, how big of an area, how do you separate them, yeah. what happens if something happens between and two owners. We don't have staff that can actually deal with those type of things. So we'll be looking at all that and come, coming back to well, council. Well, Senate is going to put one up, a right. big one. So, yeah. I mean, it, it used to be a, a real demand in Glendale. I, I think that will really reduce the demand. So I, I'm not sure you'd want to compromise that park. There is one in, in over by Griffith Park also by that zoo yeah. drive off ramp, not a, not which is pretty close to Maple Park right. or to um, Griffith, Griffith Manor Park. Yeah. No, I was just, I was only asking the question because he had brought it up and he was um, lobbying, I think, everybody that was there that day about it, so. He did bring it up at the city council meeting the next day, I think, or the week, that week, and uh, we are going to come back with a report to the council. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Item 5810D, CDBG Homeless Programs. Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, con members of the um, commission, uh, to keep you abreast of what the CWG staff and advisory committee are, are currently working on, uh, as I indicated in the report, one of the basic responsibilities of the advisory committee, which is a mandate by the city council, is to be as informed and knowledgeable about how programs that they fund actually operate. Um, as a result, there are two opportunities for committee members to conduct site visits and visit the programs and observe how the programs uh, run um, uh, to get to talk to staff, the executive directors, and some of the board members. And uh, one way, in our funding agreements with the agencies, there is a clause which tells the agencies that um, a CDBG advisory committee member can make a, a, a visit at any time th throughout the year and that they are to make arrangements and uh, accommodate those individual <laughs> site visits. But the more successful uh, structured way of conducting site visits is to take tours. The committee members to meet at City Hall all board a, a van and then take a tour and, and, and they can talk to each other and they can visit and ask questions um, at, the, um, at, at, at the agency's offices. Uh, those meetings uh, are brown acted. Um, on occasion the media will, will uh, come along, um, but, more, but more often than not they don't. So those side visits will begin, there are going to be three consecutive Wednesday afternoons beginning Wednesday, September 29th, uh, all the way through October 20th. Then in between on October 13th will be the next CDBG Advisory Committee meeting. Um, on the, included on the agenda will be a presentation by Path to Chief Glendale regarding the status of their new access center and emergency shelter development project, which as you know is CDBG funded through the HUD Section 108 program. Uh, the committee will review and approve, reprogram and recapture CDBG funds. We've had a couple of projects which have been canceled. Uh, one is a YWCA capital improvement project totaling about, about $70,000 that they've canceled because they, uh, they couldn't meet the eligibility requirements of the CDBG program. And the other is the New Horizons. I think you all know by now New Horizons has uh, decided to, to sell the property instead of building the Children's Village uh, Child Development Center that they had planned, and so they will be paying the city back $301,000 as soon as they can sell that property. Also at that meeting, the committee will review and approve the fiscal year 2011-2012 program priorities, which are based on the committee input that we are receiving. Um, the committee will review and approve a preliminary 2010-2012 CDBG funding allocation plan by funding category, which is currently estimated at $3.7 million. Oh, 
And uh, then the committee will be asked to review and approve our request for funding proposal funding application at that meeting. Uh, we do have a, a public meeting or a public hearing scheduled this Thursday at 7 p.m. at Horace Mann Elementary School. This is the public hearing where we ask, um, we invite members of the community to come and um, tell us what they perceive to be the priority needs in our community. And we break, typically we break out into three focus groups, typically one Armenian focus group, one Spanish focus group, and an English focus group. So that's coming up this Thursday evening. And typically a couple of the advisory committee members will uh, attend to, to observe uh, what the community is telling us are their priority needs. So that gives you an idea of what the uh, CDBG staff and the advisory committee are up to these days. Right. Chess, the, the money that's coming back from the YW and New Horizons, how is that redistributed out or what happens with that? Uh, typically what happens is the advisory committee will recommend to um, in, include those additional funds as part of the RFP process. Um, <clears throat> so that rather than having $300,000 available to the community uh, to receive proposals, we would have 300 plus the, the, YM, the YWCA's amount and New Horizons amount. Or if there is a current uh, a project that um, happens to need additional funds, then the advisory committee could consider uh, reprogramming the funds directly to another project. Could be an existing project, could be a priority project that has arisen, so they've, they've got some options. And then their uh, recommendations are recommendations that go to the city council, so city council has the final approval authority. Okay. Uh, well, what they'll probably do at their meeting is to reprogram it as part of the RFP process. Um, but we're, we are looking at um, a possibly one project that we might be asking them to consider to reprogram the funds to directly. Uh, but we'll know, we'll know more in a couple of weeks. Great. Thank you very much. The one last item. Yes, item 5A10E, Workforce Development. Last but not least. We're done. Good afternoon, uh, <laughs> no, I, I just thought maybe you're tired of being here. <laughs> number at number ten. <laughs> um, we held a uh, graduation of our uh, parolees on Friday. There was an article in the news about that. The pleasures that we had was uh, parolees had an opportunity to okay. acknowledge and thank Commissioner uh, Bennett. Uh, GED curriculum and uh, for the last uh, five months has been training. Uh, for about uh, the morning every week for the last five months, and so um, we have two of those parolees that now are on the verge of uh, taking the uh, GED tests. Uh, in the next couple weeks, and uh, so I think uh, on behalf of the staff that's had the honor and uh, pleasure of working with uh, Richard, uh, it's been something that's really, I think, changed some lives, so uh, I think it's a well-deserved uh, recognition that took place on uh, Friday. Thank Thanks, Tom. Great. Thank you. Before I know we need to wrap up in two minutes, I wanted to mention something real quick. If the rest of the commissioners agreed about your idea about putting a, a nonprofit on the maybe on their next agenda. We can have a five minute presentation and maybe we could put them up towards the top of the agenda. Sure. And then they can do their presentation, go back to work, and then we'll finish off. Absolutely. The only concern I would have would be on a with a packet like today, you know, five minutes, you know, we I think we should let George use his discretion on how we do that, whether we can fit in or not. Well, you know, fits. we can fit it. What we'll do is we'll balance what we're doing with our agenda as well. I mean, we go over the agenda and we'll take out if something is, is going to seem like it's going to be too long, we'll take it out and bring it back, you know, the, sure. the month after. It's just if it's priority, we'll bring it. Uh, so we can, we'll balance it out. That would be great. Uh, Gary will give up some of his time. <laughs> there won't be any, any music with Gary. Voluntarily or involuntarily. <laughs> 
the other thing is just trying to figure out how you how you kind of pick who's going to come and present it and right. how that's going to work. Right. So I figure you guys can kind of we'll leave that at work the that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work it out with the executive uh, directors. We can work that out. You know, the only comment I would have, though, about that is, for instance, uh, GAR in May, the first Saturday in May, has their major fundraiser. So, you know, if if they they would come, I would think we would schedule them for April. And if some other organizations, Path Achieve, you know, would come, you know, the month before their fundraiser, that that might make sense too. So, I think. That would be a consideration. And sure. I think that could be worked out with that executive yeah. director group. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll get a master calendar a schedule, and they can fill in when they'd like to come. Yeah, that'd be great. Do you guys have anything else? I, I've got just a sure. few things, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll get killed if I don't mention Unity Fest. Suzette's probably watching, but Unity Fest is coming up October 10. Uh, you'll see these flyers all over town and at our community centers. It is an international international street fair, Sunday, October 10, 2010, from 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock on Brand Boulevard between California and Lexington. Uh, it's going to be a global marketplace, live entertainment, international food court, arts and crafts, children's games, and farmer's market. The admission is free. There's free parking at the Orange Street Garage. So I encourage all residents to uh, go to Unity Fest and have a good time. The other thing is we will be bringing you back a uh, contract with Joanne and I and um, Gary and Dave. We're working on a, a contract with the Collegiate Wood Bat League. Uh, there's a team that's interested in making Glendale their home. It's almost a, a, um, a, uh, what they, a farm club type of deal where these are the best college kids in California and sometimes outside of California that play in this league. Uh, so the level of competition is really going to be tremendous. And this will be one team in Glendale. There's several in Santa Barbara, several down south, I think. Uh, Palm Springs has one. Uh, so it'll be like a minor league operation. And so we're working out on the details wow. with, with a gentleman. Sport? Who, it's baseball. Uh -huh. It's a wooden bat. Um, we don't care about the divorce that's going on. We've got our own ball team. Go yeah, on. you know, I think the I've seen the level of play of these kids. It's really, really good. So it'll be good baseball. It's, it will be at Stengel, yeah. Yeah, we have some minor things that we have to do to the field to, to make it presentable to them. He's talking about an all-star game that's televised by Fox. June 13th. It'll yeah, be the June Fox 13th, televises right? to about 65 million households, apparently. So, oh, wow. Um, Boy, that'd be great. Yeah, so we're working on the details of that. We'll bring back hopefully so a long-term contract. So it's like triple-A, double-A? It's, uh, I guess... It's an off-season league. Yeah. Off-season league. So, uh, it's, it gets everyone ready for use, the use of the wooden bat because don't forget in high school and collegiate we're playing with a aluminum bat or composite it, bat. These are Division One players, right. kids who are really getting ready good. for the major leagues. Yeah. I think of um, they have something I think like that on the East Coast. It's, mm -hmm. it's the uh, I Cape, Cod. The Cape, Cape Cod, Cod League. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, there's a Cape Cod League, there's a uh, Alaska League, uh -huh. so they want to make this league comparable to those. Great. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's exciting. Hello. On that positive note, we'll conclude our hearing. Thank you very much.